Well, citizens, a pleasure indeed to, to welcome you once again to Hal Monticello. I'm afraid that you discovered me enjoying right here in our North Pavilion uh, a look-see at the progress of our university, our University of Virginia. Uh, the work is coming along quite well, and I'm very much looking forward to beginning to build the rotunda. And the reason is significant for uh, the subject that I look forward to discussing with you today. Uh, the reason is astronomy. Oh, I am hoping someday to build a, an observatory at our university. But during the interim, no, it'll be the rotunda that I look forward to designing uh, with the interior uh, revealing the constellations, etc. But let that be a subject we might cover today. Uh, I'm happy to say that we have with us again Ms. Alice Wagner, uh, who will moderate uh, our questions. And um, before we begin, may I take a chair? Well, thank you. Well, Ms. Wagner, what, uh, what are some of the questions that our visitors have for us today? Well, Mr. Jefferson, I actually wanted to let you know that this Saturday, May 15th, we will be celebrating National Astronomy Day. Oh my. Well, no subject could be more pleasing to me, I rest you assured of that. Oh, it has been a fascination from my youth, an entire national day devoted uh, to the science of astronomy. All I can simply say is what wonders will be there for us to enjoy. You mentioned you've been interested in the subject of astronomy since your youth. Were you exposed to it in your early education? Oh, my heavens. <laughs> Anyone who resides out in the wilderness is exposed to the wonders of the universe. Uh, you have only to enjoy eventide, uh, oftentimes as I would, simply lying in the cool grass and gazing up to limitless stars. Limitless Candlelight can hardly destroy the illumination of the heavens. You're able to see, I, I would wager, if not millions, perhaps an astronomical account, billions of stars and be intrigued with how far does the universe expand and where are we situated in this universe? Here upon the tiny little earth. I had the opportunity to be further inspired with an interest in astronomy by my own father, Colonel Peter Jefferson. He was quite accomplished in surveying, and of course, an idea of astronomy and the, the constellations is essential to the art of surveying and to mathematics. And so growing up, yes, my own father was of the first and foremost inspiration, uh, me particularly interested uh, in surveying from my youth. Though my father was passed away uh, in 1757, monies in his estate allowed me to pursue my education. So I had the opportunity to travel east to Williamsburg and there attend the Old Royal College of William and Mary. Now, there were two great influences uh, at William and Mary. Uh, the first was my teacher, Dr. William Small. He was a Scot. And he held the chair of mathematics and natural philosophy there. He was not there very long. In fact, when I left uh, William and Mary, that was 1762, uh, he left two years later and returned to England, where coincidentally he became a member of the Lunar Society. But in any respect, Dr. Small, a man of gentlemanly, correct manners, and enlarged and, and uh, well, liberal mind. He had thoughts on everything and was always open-minded. And thirdly, he had a happy talent for communication. And I would say that he furthered my interest uh, in astronomy, particularly the applications of mathematics to astronomy, particularly such applications in ascertaining not only the latitude, but the most difficult, longitude. And uh, he made introduction uh, to Mr. George Wythe, under whom I read law for several years. Mr. Wythe, no less, though a teacher in law, was devoted to the study of astronomy. Now, secondly, it was not Mr. Wythe, but actually my good friend, John Page. Oh, Johnny Page and I were often together, and I would visit at his family farm, which was in Gloucester, across the York River, known as Rosewell. 
It was one of the most magnificent mansion houses in all of Virginia, let alone in the colonies. And what was topped on Rosewell Plantation House was a very large cupola. The cupola housing one of the most magnificent telescopes. And it was there with that telescope that Johnny Page and I had many pleasant observations of the constellations and the universe. Your next question, Ms. Wright. When you went to Philadelphia as a young man, who were the individuals you met who were already studying astronomy and what did you learn from them? I would venture to say one individual, there were many, but one individual will ever stand out. And that was Mr. David Rittenhouse. He was a most unique individual and had been so from his youth. Do you know it is said that he became very intrigued with the tool chest of his uncle, uh, intrigued with the application of some various tools, intrigued with the detail in carpentry. And so it was that he actually designed and built several clocks. Well, as a result of being interested in clocks, of course, you were then interested, as he was, in ascertaining longitude. A timepiece is essential for that. And furthermore, Rittenhouse created what are known as orreries. Orreries are most intelligent, magnificent devices showing, if you will, the, uh, the revolving of the moon about the earth, the earth about the sun, and then further uh, to show the, the revolving of various moons about the planets and the planets' orreries uh, uh, rotations and uh, uh, revolutions around the sun itself. So I cannot emphasize enough the, uh, the influence that David Rittenhouse uh, has had on me through my entire life since we first met in Philadelphia. Uh, in fact, I will tell you that I asked him initially to uh, create an astronomical clock for me that I would be able to ascertain uh, solar eclipses uh, about when the, uh, the various phases of the moon uh, might be followed to let us know when that could occur in the future. Well, we have a guest with us who shares a name with me, another Alice, and she would like to know if you have a favorite planet. I would venture to say that my favorite of all the planets, uh, where, where do you begin and where do you end? Of course, I only know seven. Let me see, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. Um, I would say that Mars continues to intrigue me. And then yet Venus is such a, a fascinating and curious planet. Uh, to ascertain the moons that are wont to revolve around Jupiter keeps one spellbound when you, you sight it in the evening sky. Uh, and though I'm afraid that my refract refracting telescopes, uh, the Dolans, I have two of them, uh, do not allow me to see so extensively that I might uh, thereby discover Uranus for myself, as Herschel did, uh, there is still that speculation that uh, it must be most unusual at such a far distance from the sun. So I guess I have said uh, what are planets outside of our own Earth, but that is never ever to deny our own Earth as my most favorite of all the planets we know thus far in <laughs> revolution around the sun. Elaine wants to know if while you were crossing the Atlantic on your way to Paris, uh, if you used the opportunity of the ocean to do some stargazing. Absolutely. And I will tell you, Elaine, that next to indeed the magnificence of the evening sky here in the wilderness of Albemarle County, well, it is even more complete when you're out there in the middle of the ocean because of the horizon. Uh, there are no mountains out there as we are wont to see here uh, in our horizon, and therefore you are able to see the stars as if they sit upon the ocean itself uh, with the waves often giving the image that the stars themselves are swimming or going beneath the ocean at some point. It is a magnificent experience. And by all means, Elaine, yes, I used a sextant to ascertain uh, where the ship might be in its sail, not only over to France, but as well returning from France. Uh, of course, the North Star is always used with the sextant in order to determine exactly your latitude. 
So I had that uh, to remind me of having used the North Star here at Monticello to ascertain the same calculations. In fact, the North Star from our North Pavilion uh, is in this direction uh, as I point. And it is remarkable to think what it would be like to sit there an entire evening, whether at sea or up on top of Al Monticello, and see all the stars in their constellations revolve around Polaris. While you were in France, were there people there or other opportunities that widened your knowledge of astronomy? I would say that the most interesting uh, individual that I encountered with respect to astronomy uh, was the Comte de Cassini. The Comte de Cassini presided, he was the astronomer royal uh, appointed by the royal family and presiding uh, over the um, observatory in Paris. And so, yes, I had the opportunity to visit with him, and in particular, I asked of him whether he would allow me to set my watch precisely as he, the Comte de Cassini, felt the exact time would be with the idea of the meridian right through Paris, ascertained by their observatory. Now, the reason I say this, many an Englishman is already contending with me. I can hear them. Yes, they're saying, oh, no, 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 Mr. Jefferson. The, the prime meridian, the actual observatory, must be Greenwich. There are no others to compete. Well, not as I know it. There's been competition amongst many observatories for many, many years, if not centuries. The French obviously believe theirs in Paris is to ascertain. The Germans have one in Berlin that is one to be suggested as the absolute uh, beginning of zero degrees. And then, of course, what about in Copenhagen? Oh, yes, the Danes believe that their own observatory is paramount. Now, I will tell you that even I have taken the advantage to suggest why not have the meridian established in our own country and where else but in Washington. And so I was wont to establish a meridian stone up on what is referred to as Meridian Hill. Uh, and they tell me it is still there. I'm happy to know that. But it could very well be, Elaine, that, um, that in the future, no matter what I desire to, uh, to engage in Paris, uh, or whether the English think it is Greenwich or the Germans elsewhere, I believe in time we shall all come together and establish one zero degree uh, of longitude. Now, which one, which capital it will be? I would hope it would be ours. Uh, but perhaps it may be still to be decided between France and England. Nevertheless, I think I was want to compliment the Comte de Cassini by asking him how I might set my timepiece properly and finally. <laughs> Several of our guests are wondering what types of equipment have you used for astronomical studies and where did you acquire them? Well, I thank you for that. I've had uh, quite a number of, of pieces of astronomical equipment acquired over the years uh, from Mr. Barden, William Barden of England, London in particular. Uh, I have acquired uh, two terrestrial globes. Uh, they are exactly what you would think. They uh, represent not the Earth itself, but the constellations that you see from various points on the Earth at one particular time. Uh, I mentioned, as you uh, found me looking through my telescope, that I had two refracting telescopes uh, made by Peter and John Donald. Uh, they are from London, and uh, this one here, though quite small, and actually the one that perhaps saved my life when Captain Jack Jewett warned us of the advance of Bannister Tarleton's Dragoons, oh, these telescopes, they sit up on stands, and they're quite magnificent as you can set them at an angle. And so those two Dolland telescopes have been with me for several years as I um, purchased the one in the 90s and one a few years later. Uh, then the equatorial telescope, uh, the Ramsden, I'm quite proud of that. Oh, it's a magnificent telescope. And uh, it sits at an angle on a particular clock-like device which allows it to turn in order to follow the rotation of the Earth. Remember again the, the difficulty of establishing longitude uh, because as we know, the earth is rotating uh, east from west 
will then, in order to establish longitude, recognizing that we are following west to east, or excuse me, the road is rotating west to east, and we are traveling east. Do you see how difficult this is? It is Ramsden's equatorial telescope that helps us to follow this rotation. It's a magnificent piece, sits at an angle, if you will, uh, quite large. And lamentably, I must tell you that I've loaned that out to, um, to uh, Mr. Boyd, Herman Boyd, uh, back in the year 20. And I hope he returns it soon because I desire to gift it to our university. Uh, they have to find its place uh, in the observatory that I'm planning. Now, furthermore, if you will, I have a, a, a ori. I have two of them uh, that I've been able to acquire. Uh, and they, of course, are in wonderful detail because in building the ori, you want to make sure that you have the earth tilted uh, at its angle of rotation to the sun so that you can actually tell the seasons throughout the year, and then also uh, to have the moon so positioned that we know more precisely how it rotates around the earth. And that is difficult because we have not yet ascertained the exact uh, motion of rotation of the earth, of the moon uh, around the earth. Uh, and then of course, all the planets accordingly to be rotating uh, around the sun. This is the difficult thing because it's not all in a straight line as one might assume. Uh, this is all somewhat at random angles uh, during that great and magnificent rotation uh, of our own particular solar system. Uh, and then an astronomical clock. I made mention earlier that in becoming acquainted with Mr. Rittenhouse, I asked him to build uh, an astronomical clock for me. Oh, I cared not for any of the um, filigrees or the, the foo-foos that you might have to ornament uh, adorn a great tall place clock. No, I want it devoted specifically to the mathematics of astronomy, that we might ascertain uh, the coming of a solar eclipse, per se. And uh, I waited and waited, and lamentably, Mr. Rittenhouse never did get around to, uh, to making that clock for me. And so becoming well acquainted with one Henry Voigt, uh, a Swiss gentleman in Philadelphia, uh, his own son, Thomas Voigt, has become responsible for the regulation of the great clocks in Philadelphia City. And so I asked if his son, Thomas Voigt, might make for me an astronomical clock. And happily he did. Uh, one that is very precise in its mathematical calculations. I've somewhat tinkered with it myself, I'm not going to deny. I, I have written inside the case of the clock uh, well, the names of the days of the week, so that I might know that more precisely. Uh, and I will tell you another thing. Uh, he said it would take some time to complete. He said he would need at least one week to regulate the clock himself while still in Philadelphia. And then it was decided in order to safely be sent to me, it had to be all crated and, uh, and comforted in its crate uh, to go by water. Well, at the time he was ready to send the clock by water, <laughs> the Delaware River froze over, let alone the James River. Oh, we were at a, a great default when I should receive it. So to make a long story short on this, it took seven years for the Voigt astronomical clock to finally arrive here at El Monticello. And I'm very proud to, to show it to you there in my library where it keeps perfect time. Bridget would like to know, what is the most fascinating astronomical event you have ever recorded or witnessed? Oh, well, <laughs> I think the near total eclipse here in Charlottesville, back when I was a young man in 17 and 78, in fact, who will ever forget the date? It was the 24th of June. And uh, realizing that this was about to occur and realizing because of my devotion to following the almanacs, and the idea of when this eclipse would take place in North America, let alone in Charlottesville, I was ready for it. And so was my friend, the Reverend James Madison, uh, who was president of uh, the old Royal College of William & Mary in Williamsburg. We were maintaining a correspondence back and forth. He was devoted to the science of astronomy as well. Well, what we came to discover 
is that the particular clips of 78 would be more perfect in Williamsburg than I might be able to bear witness here in Charlottesville. And <laughs> lamentably, when that day began for me and I was ever steady to watch the eclipse, can you imagine it was a cloudy day and I missed the whole beginning of it. Whereas otherwise in Williamsburg, Virginia, the Reverend Madison was much more able to observe the magnificence of that total eclipse. So much so that he was able to bear witness to, I would venture to say, complete darkness. In fact, he called it awful, awful, he said, because of the stillness, the darkness, and the fact that you could not even see an individual at 20 yards. We had another total eclipse in 1811. Uh, it was not uh, entirely uh, for either here in Charlottesville or elsewhere close by. But it did allow me to calculate uh, more the difference between the time uh, the moon came between the earth and sun, and though not entirely, then calculating the time again, if you will, with your timepiece, to calculate the time then that the moon would pass to the other side of the sun and therefore for to calculate that distance in time was to, what helped to establish more definitively the longitude which I have established over the year uh, years is about uh, 78 uh, degrees here uh, to the west. Ronnie would like to know if you think it's possible there could be life on one of the other planets. <laughs> Who is to say not so? That's the question we should all ask ourselves. When you, I go back to the beginning, Ronnie, when I was talking about growing up here in the wilderness, uh, let alone when you're out at sea and you're able to see the stars play upon the horizon, who in their right mind would not think we are not the only ones. There has to be in this vast creation uh, by our maker. There has to be. Without a question in my mind, he has provided us many blessings. But who is to say what there is beyond us? This is the great wonder. And this, I believe, we ought to be devoted to pursue and to better understand. That's why calculations in astronomy are so very, very necessary. And remember, too, we spoke a while back on the genius of William Shakespeare. Hmm? And what is his particular line, if you will, in Hamlet? There's more in heaven and earth than meets the eye. So no matter what we may see through our own eyes, in the capacity of our own minds, which are perhaps vastly limited compared to the entire universe, what it would lead one to suspect, yes, there has to be so much, much more. Will the astronomy be taught at the University of Virginia? Astronomy without a question will be taught at our University of Virginia. I, I consider it just as valuable as architecture. I've never written that precisely, but it is the point of the matter. You may know in my design of our University of Virginia, I am attempting to represent various uh, shall we say, errors or fancies in architecture as the facade of our, our pavilions, our ten pavilions. And so therefore, architecture lifts our spirit. It, it gives us a sense, if you will, of the nobility of proportion, uh, not only in how we shelter ourselves, but in our own lives. Astronomy is no less than that. Astronomy gives us an idea of proportion in our own lives relevant to the universe. Where does our earth sit with respect to the universe? This is so necessary to understand. This is why, as I mentioned earlier, my father, Mr. George With, Johnny Page, and Dr. William Small were of such great influence in my early education because they helped one to understand their place. And I mean that not in society, oh, good heavens, no, but particularly in a meritocracy what we can do to improve the tastes and the knowledge of our countrymen, to understand 
your place within yourself, your place upon this globe, how we might continue to venture into terra incognita, unknown land, and with the use, if you will, of surveying and astronomy, then to learn how others may venture there more freely and securely. Now, this no less a study, as you can well understand now, uh, of the late Captain Meriwether Lewis. In fact, I, I made certain that he went to Philadelphia that spring of 1803 to learn the elements of astronomy and mathematics, not only from uh, Mr. Patterson at the University of Pennsylvania, but from Mr. Andrew Ellicott as well. It was so necessary on that core of discovery to ascertain where and how uh, the mighty Missouri was meandering in terra incognita. Uh, what streams and creeks and other rivers would conclude into the great Missouri? How we might pass through the stony mountains across what are now called the Rockies and connect ultimately to the great Western Ocean. So all of this, again, I cannot emphasize more uh, to be important uh, as it has been from time immemorial, the ancient Greeks in particular, let alone the Romans, through the medieval ages, now and well into the future. Do you think our nation's government should support further discoveries in astronomy, and how would that be a useful part of government? Yes, without a question, absolutely yes. To continue to study this universe, you heard me earlier, uh, desire that Washington City provide the meridian for our continent, and I would hope for the rest of the world. And so I therefore commissioned that meridian stone uh, in Washington City. Uh, I think that when you consider all of the interest in, uh, in astronomy, uh, to consider how we can better understand applying mathematics uh, to our knowledge of the universe, let alone uh, to surveying, uh, to better understand how we might thereby map our coastline, map if you will, the boundaries of our nations. Uh, I wish we had understood that better at the Treaty of Paris. There was a, a bit of a disagreement between Dr. Franklin and the British as to the northeast boundary uh, of our new nation. So astronomy helps us in order to pursue this for the benefit of our nation and therefore must be supported by our government. And thirdly, it is simply fun. Astronomy is fun. So for these particular reasons, by all accounts, I think astronomy is necessary uh, in its support of our, of our government. And here's the other, although I, I was not too quick to admit it early, but what about our nation's defense? If we are to presume that there might be others out in the universe, well, not only ourselves, but the rest of the world ought to be very, very concerned about defending ourselves. Might that not be another reason why our nation should continue to, to make alliances and treaties of peace and collaboration with foreign nations to bring us all together as the family of man upon this globe, that we might realize how unique we are to inhabit this beautiful planet and at the same time be protected and defended amongst ourselves by anything that could be somewhat... Um, designing otherwise in the universe. Well, Mr. Jefferson, we have just one last question for you. What do you believe is yet to be discovered in the study of astronomy? I do not believe that Uranus is the, uh, the final planet to be discovered. I think there are more. I just have that sense that we will discover with more powerful telescopes. In fact, if I could get my... Um, my equatorial telescope back uh, from Mr. Boyd, I would pursue it myself to, to look far, far further into the universe and discover what might be the differentiation between a star and a very distant planet. Uh, I think furthermore, we should consider for gaining further knowledge about the moon. It's so nearby. And so many have studied it for so many years. <laughs> I'll never forget who was it who believed that, um, that the, the craters that we observe on the moon were once volcanoes exploding about. Well, no, no, here's something that of late we've been able to discern uh, more properly as, as craters, that, that the moon has been beleaguered with constant stones falling from the heavens. And there's another thing, these stones that fall from the skies. Now, I will tell you, um, the teacher up at Yale, Silman, is want to suggest that I'm not believing 
uh, of these stones falling from the sky, that I am prone to consider that they are uh, stories created by others who want to be sensational. Now, I've never said that. I've never said that. I'm questioning. I will continue to raise questions. Someone the other day said, well, Mr. Jefferson, what do you think about, I think they referred to them as meteorites. Well, that is clever. There you are. There's our future. There's a necessity for further study uh, and speculation. So, yes, I, I should like to be convinced myself as to what these stones are that fall from the heavens and have received um, quite uh, varied and extant accounts, extensive accounts. So there you are as, uh, as far as what needs to be, but you know, <laughs> that is what I believe uh, still needs to be. My mind is still very much like this. And that is why this is so necessary a study, not only at our university, not only for our government, but I believe for the family of man across the globe. Why? Because in my opinion, it just brings us the closer together to marvel at who we are as the family of man itself. Well, citizens, I thank you for the opportunity that I could be in your company on such a delightful subject as today. I hope you will come visit here at our Monticello, that you too may look out, if not from the North Pavilion, from our, our North Terrace walkway at the progress of our university. Uh, and also to be able to bring you out of doors uh, in the eventide here when the stars sparkle at great distance uh, to look through my Dolland telescopes, if you will, to see what you yourselves may observe and thereby continue these delightful wonders that bless us here, not only at our Monticello, but in our nation. I remain your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed.